All right, I'm Brian Costello. Today, which follows perfectly, because again, this is an Elder Scrolls Online version, which deals a lot with that. Except I'm on PlayStation, so we can't uh, no! get up there. So, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. So Ollie, get it? We can yeah, yeah. get together. But in any case, this actually is something because, of course, throughout my research and everything dealing with early medieval graves and early medieval Europe, furnished burials in the 7th century. Uh, of course, a lot of people that have done a PhD know you need to turn your brain off. Mine was to go home and play Elder Scrolls Online every night. And going through this, going through mortuary landscapes and everything, I'm like. A lot of things are starting to connect here. I'm getting a lot of good ideas. And this is sort of a paper that I put together that I'm still thinking through and a lot of ideas and actually research that's still coming out right now and a lot of different people around Europe are studying it. Uh, so this is looking at understanding grave reopening and specifically the process of uh, through Tamriel uh, and its correlations to early medieval Europe. So a quick synopsis, of course, we've all heard a lot about Elder Scrolls today. Tamriel, is ex the world of Elder Scrolls, is inspired by a variety of medieval aspects, among others. There's early prehistoric aspects. There's all the way some Victorian architecture that's thrown in there because it is a fantasy world made by people. But it's a series that involves multiple quests to enter specifically and famously mortuary landscapes and to retrieve important objects. Recent studies also in the non-game world, as we've said, uh, have identified a process of grave reopening across Northwest Europe. And through the normality of grave robbing in Skyrim, Elder Scrolls, Morrowind, the whole series, uh, early, medieval, early medieval grave reopening can be further understood. And this has led to new and wider questions specifically about life within the archaeology of early medieval Europe. So, oh, that's right. Thank you very much. Yep. I'm loud enough, so it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> In any case, of course, just a quick overview of what I'm talking about with the early medieval part. This is the 5th to 7th centuries of mostly Northwest Europe, the migration period is what it's known as, and places like Anglo-Saxon England. It was a proto-historic period with a lack of written records until the 7th century and beyond. It is very well known for its furnished burials, both in inhumation and cremation burials. A lot of cemeteries were large cemeteries with smaller satellite ones, and those large ones are understood to be used by multiple communities, multiple families, and places where funerals were times of gathering, remembrance, and actually a time of political stratification leading to a lot of formation of kingdoms in the seventh century. So just a quick overview on these burials of the migration period. Of course, the inhumation burials have generally follow a gender sort of with weapons assemblage going to a male gendered burial, dress accessories, brooches, necklaces going with a female gender for the most part, but not always. And objects generally displayed or equated to a life cycle. So a lot of objects like swords wouldn't be given to a child's grave for the most part. They'd mostly found in adult burials. There are some special cases, which you'll see in a bit, but they did sort of follow this. So funerals were an emotive time, of course, in gathering and remembrance, and they were a platform to remember or create an identity of the deceased through, using the, through the use of objects. Objects were utilized as technologies of remembrance. They were mnemonic, and they uh, allowed a remembrance of other things and other stories about the people that owned them, people that used them, and the deceased in the wider family for all of those gathered at the funeral. So, of course, a lot of these objects were objects of wealth and status. We had objects of gold, gilt, glam, garnets, everything. The works, uh, there was an inequality, showing that there was an inequality and actually a competitive element to these cemeteries. And as previously been acknowledged that there were some socially important or recognizable biographical objects put into these graves, i.e. curated objects or heirlooms. Why would you bury an heirloom? <laughs> So that's where my personal research came in, and I was looking for these heirlooms. That was my PhD research, and I'm continuing it today. It was to identify what types of objects were considered heirlooms that were placed in these graves, to analyze their mnemonic roles during the funerals, and to understand the social complexity of biographical objects enacted through grave contexts. So which objects were heirlooms? Well, through archaeological evidence and historical evidence, it pointed towards swords and brooches, one for each of those gendered burials. Both were found to be objects of elevated social status. Many were elaborately created. Uh, and there were a variety of different types of brooches different, like, that showed different identities with combinations from different areas. Uh, and swords were the rarest type of object in this period, uh, found in, within the weapons assemblage, and were found in mostly the wealthiest burials. 
So for an example of this, one of the graves that I had from my research was a from Buckland in Kent. It was a burial of someone that was about six years old of age, but they were portrayed, had an identity created through objects as a very mature adult and a very wealthy adult for a six-year-old, which is very rare and you don't really see this during this time period. Uh, throughout all the crazy objects that were placed in there, which were likely none of them owned by them, so it could be considered everything could be an heirloom, but however, the socially important ones of the brooches, there was one very worn, abraded, and broken brooch you could see there that had evidence of repairs all the way through. And from being in the grave of a six-year-old and knowing the life cycles, it was obviously owned and used by some previously at least one other person, probably two. Going through this, and it was actually chosen to go into the grave looking like that. There's plenty of evidence of brooches being repaired to fix them and everything. This was chosen compared to everything else to look tarnished, abraded, and broken highlighting more of the biography of the object for the funeral and the memory of that and connecting to the other people around. So this was likely owned by another person and really this could be seen, a couple interpretations I had are negotiations between the paternal and maternal family of the deceased of the child and also it's kind of showing that connecting to other people in the wider family or kin network more so than the actual identity of the deceased. So. That was from this, but this was all based on one process that was really started and re-looked at in 2013 by Ali Klevness, and this was the process of grave reopening. So before this, early excavations always found disturbed graves, robbed graves, and that's how they kind of recorded it. However, re-looking at this, this is a process that was reopening graves and only going in to take specific types of objects, leaving everything else. And this was happening within a decade after burial. This was specifically selecting the objects that were being taken and it was a local tradition. So it's like cemetery here, didn't happen. A mile over, it was happening constantly. And it was really a selected, a specific uh, localized area across Northwest Europe from Anglo-Saxon England, Merovingian France, and a few other places, Scandinavia. So this was an ongoing process. The knowledge of the grave and its location was needed. And a lot of times they were digging right into giant mound constructions, just showing immense effort was going to get the objects in. And of course, the two objects they were trying to get, swords and brooches, and leaving everything else, which is really interesting. And by say leaving everything else, we have necklaces of bracteates, gemstones, everything. Those were moved, bronze brooches were taken, and the necklace put back. So it's really going in for these socially significant objects, more so than the materiality or even raw materials. So this is still really being talked about today, and actually more cemeteries are being discovered, and it's really looking at, well, what's going on here? So of course, swords may have been in poor states when they were taken out. Everybody knows iron in the ground, for people that know the metallurgy, that after iron's in the ground, it doesn't look nice coming out. And even after a decade, not really either. We find pieces of it, and these objects are still being taken. So the first interpretation was, it's not just how they looked, but actually the possession of these would, uh, despite the state, imbue the social status to the ownership within the community. So retrieval signifies a con uh, possible continued or extended circulation of these objects. And really, it's looking at now, this is a socially acceptable process, but it's still being talked about. So there are a lot of issues in the medieval period that have kind of held back these interpretations. One, a lot of previous interpretations have been caused by projection of later views of burial, that graves may have needed to stay shut and not actually thinking of going back and opening them. When we're looking at earlier periods, prehistoric periods of the constant use of barrow, barrows returning, this is actually a normal practice in other time periods and other cultures. And even in the Viking sagas, there's plenty of examples of Viking sagas where the reopening of graves uh, to get magical swords, talking to the dead, and things like that coming out is a common trope. So, brings us to Tamriel, man the world. So of course, we've heard a lot about it already, so I can give you a quick recap, it is a fantasy game, but Tamriel Online, of course, takes all different regions, and throughout, there's a lot of late Roman to post-Roman to all the way through different aspects, but it's really medieval-based, a lot of things, very medievally influenced. And of course, players can choose their humanoid characters of different styles and species and things, and it is a world of dragons, demons, and cheese-crazed deities throughout, <laughs> it's got it all, so. But one thing that's a common trope in all the games is mortuary landscapes. Always one thing that maybe it's for the writers that made this, it's like going into haunted areas, things like that, where the dead are, always had an allure to put some of the best loot, you could say, for characters to go. So many take place in cemeteries, barrows, crypts, tombs, all created of places for adventure, quests to go, get loot that could be for in-game monetary value or make improve your character. 
So there's my character. I am, yes, a one-eyed orc archer, uh, which has not that good because he has depth recession problems. So <laughs> but this is uh, the online version. So again, playing with multiple people. Uh, and I'm going to talk about two case studies here which relate to grave reopening for two different reasons. So the first one takes place in the northwest, so it's a very desolate, mountainous area called Rivenspire, where it's infested by vampires too, which made things fun. But there's a crypt built into a mountainside, which is, the area is circled in red. If anybody does play, you'll know this area, uh, which is filled with angry skeletons and ghosts that try to stop you from going in. However, upon entering this tomb, you, you find a nice ghost that's leading you through the tomb as you're fighting all these ghosts, as the ghost is running in front of you and you're getting attacked by skeletons and everything all over the place. And after you fight through, this ghost leads you to a sword sticking out of a tomb. You're looking at it, so of course you look at the sword and it's got a name engraved on it, in, which inferred to be the ghost's name. It's the ghost's sword. So the quest continues, brings you to the local settlement, which was uh, circled in blue to the left of it. So nearby, so basically the tomb of the people that live there is what you get from it. And it brings you to this one guy that's sweeping his steps, an NPC, a control a computer uh, player. And of course the ghost is there again pointing at this guy. You talk to him, he starts saying, oh yeah, my great grandmother was this awesome knight that went on a lot of adventures. Ends up that the ghost is his great grandmother and she wanted you to get this heirloom, bring it back and get it back into circulation with the family. And I was like, that's pretty cool, awesome quest, nice going through. So it is the return of an heirloom to continue that circulation and this person takes a sword and return, takes up a life of honor and adventure. Second one, a bit different, this is in northern uh, elsewhere which is in the very south, a very tropical area. It is the land of the cat people called the Khajiit. Uh, it, there's an ancient crypt called the Crypt uh, Tomb of Serpents which is in north which has got a biography of its own. It was a uh, built in bygone eras and then a migrating people, the Akaviri came in and they're like, nah, you can use this, use this for your dead folk. And they're like, cool, and they got on. And so there's all these dead spirits of the Akaviri in there, guarded by their risen armors and revenants and things. So the quest begins once you enter with a would-be tomb robber. So someone's there to go get monetary value by stealing the stuff from this tomb. And they get entranced by a spirit. And this spirit's basically like, I want you to go, if you can survive, take these relics and bring them to the world to spread our power and knowledge. So you're helping this NPC by going in, uh, fighting all these raised armors and crazy things and a couple giant minotaur that are in there as well to collect these relics from these tombs. And of course, a lot of these are near some cremation urns put into bays, which is pretty cool looking at a mortuary uh, uh, point of view and they're in chests around and of course you're going through fighting these minotaurs and giant things. But once completed the relics are given to this former grave robber turned cultural ambassador and the character states that the objects will be used to spread the knowledge and power of the ancient people to those that possess. So comparing the two now. So after playing this, you know, coming home after writing and everything, marking, doing this, I'm thinking about this and going, well in Tamriel it is acceptable to venture into mortuary landscapes and retrieve significant objects. In early medieval Europe, it's acceptable to travel into mortuary landscapes and retrieve significant objects. In Tamriel, there's a quest which is encouraged and accepted by the community, and it seems to be the same in early medieval Europe. But the key thing is, is the focus is on the retrieval of these objects. And actually, one thing that really hasn't been talked about too much is the same in early medieval Europe. It is specifically on the retrieval of the objects. A lot of the past talks about this grave reopening have focused on the mechanics and the process how to get into the tomb, how to target the things, who's doing it, when, what's the time span. But really the focus is, well, what's the end goal here? <clears throat> so each example from these case studies involve different goals surrounding the objects taken from mortuary landscapes. Tribulation Crypt was to retrieve heirlooms to continue its circulation within a known family. The Tomb of Serpents was to retrieve relics, specifically relic, I mean, actually the recent memory of the people that are living then. So these were taken and to increase the status, power, and known of those that possessed them. And again, the focus was on the artifacts and their possession by the living. So grave reopening is an acceptable social practice in both, really, is what we're finding now. But why? What, was the, what is the goal of this? And this is the questions that I'm still asking and a lot of people studying this are. The type of objects potentially highlight more than static materials of status. Examples of swords and brooches reveal extended circulation from graves that were not robbed. And that's where my research really looked at, is the non-robbed or non-reopened graves and finding that these are being still circulated and then ending up in graves. And the specific choice to return, reopen, and retrieve these objects implies the need to continue their circulation within these communities for their non-material values. 
So previous research in early medieval gra grave reopening, like I said, was more focused on the process and less on the objects taken. And I'm looking at interpretations, of course, the first one from our first case study, the recirculation of family heirlooms. Uh, this was likely be done, like who is reopening these graves? Likely done by the family that was connected to these and knew where they were. Or it could be that they were significant relics to this community, and it was done by non-family members, possibly other groups. Or this could be, because we have evidence of this, of the intent to remove the significance of the deceased in a way. We see this like in anti antagonistic parties in a way. We see this a lot with uh, the Christianization of Scandinavia and the rummaging of graves post-pagan period into the Christian period. A lot of the famous ship burials had that. I think the Gottsdad ship had that that was looted in a way and taken apart after the Christianization. So we're seeing different reasons here. But really, looking at the type of objects in this period, it really looks more like the first one more than anything else, even if it wasn't their direct family, because of course the ambiguity, ambiguous nature of kin groups during this period really makes it unclear if what family really was. So previous research on early medieval heirlooms highlighted the recognizability of these biographical objects. Their implementation within burials was impactful focal points during the funeral. And these objects possess memories of events and interactions of people who were involved or owned in the object itself and the place it took, the roles it had within these past events. So heirlooms could be understood as material genealogies in a way with memories of their own of different generations. And evidence of the retrieval in certain cemeteries signifies the need to possess and continue circulation. So side quests and mortuary landscapes of Tamriel relate to grave reopening of early medieval Europe as a socially acceptable process. And we're still getting there for the reasons why, but really it's pointing to these specific types of objects that had a heightened importance within these early medieval communities. The significance of the objects reveal inquiries of familial and kin networks, object relations, and how mortuary landscapes were viewed and understood during the early medieval period. And adventuring in Tamriel is further uh, further research into burial and retrieval of heirlooms, the roles in social comp competitive communities, and a clear understanding of early medieval life. Thank you. Thank you.